Warning, the following video contains spoilers for Quake 2. Last week, I opened my door and I found something on the doorstep. It was a brand new RTX 2080 Ti. And as I did back in 1997, I popped that bad boy into my PC and I fired up Quake 2. Which seems like a crazy thing, but just recently, a new version of Quake 2 using Vulkan was released as the first path traced game. And this is absolutely fascinating and something I had to talk about here. And to do that, I brought in our resident ultra ray tracing enthusiast, Alex Patalia. Hey there, John. Uh, I cannot wait to talk about Quake 2, one of my favorite games. That's I mean, we one. both, we love Quake mm -hmm. 2. We love ray tracing. But, you know, if you're watching this, what you're seeing, you're seeing Quake 2, and you're probably thinking, okay, guys, why the heck is this special? We'll get to that. And there is, there's some interesting stuff going on here. But first, we should say, um, this new renderer for the game was crafted by a German fellow known as Christoph Schiet, a graduate PhD student here in Germany. And yeah, this thing is something else. Yeah, and uh, I think the reason why we need to say that it's so important and why this is great uh, is one, there's, I think on the left-hand side, it's open sourced, GitHub, you can download it and play with it, look at the code if you want. This is the history of id tech games, basically. They've always been made public and people do crazy thing with them. And that's where it's kind of on the other hand side, where there's a history of using id tech games like Quake, Quake 2, Quake 3, Enemy Territory Quake Wars, uh, or Quake 4 to, you know, test out ray tracing in real time. And these demos were usually done on, you know, distributed networks of CPUs and, you know, hundreds of them, if not thousands of them or something like that, or at real time on, you know, non-production hardware that never really came out in the case of Intel with its um, Larrabee project. So, so, so we're basically looking right now in this version of Quake 2, something that really only existed in a very expensive form running on CPUs or wasn't really real time at all. But here we are playing it on modern GPUs at 60 FPS at 1080p or higher. And that's the mainly impressive part. Obviously, the technicals are interesting too, but that's it. Yeah, and you know, historically, I think this is this is important. Besides being used for testing ray tracing, Quake 2 and the Quake engine in general uh, has always been kind of associated with new technologies. You, they've pioneered new technologies. You know, the original Quake was first released with uh, support for the rendition verite card, and then there was GL Quake. You know, that was pushing new technology in the form of 3D accelerators, which changed the way graphics were rendered in real time just as this is doing now. Uh, and similarly, I guess that kind of ties into how Quake 2 used to work, or still works, I suppose, uh, and how it works in this new build. So, you know, the Quake engine, the original Quake, uh, pioneered, I think it's the first game to use the, I guess, the data tree structure for light maps, essentially. Yeah. Where they, you know, they tried to solve the issue of how do you light a full map in a somewhat realistic fashion and they pre-calculated this data and stored it sort of as a texture. Uh, which, you know, it was a good solution at the time, and Quake 2 continued this, allowing colored uh, lights. A big deal. Yeah, yeah, which at the time was a huge deal, you know, moving from the monochromatic yeah. look of the original to fully colored light maps and dynamic lights, of course. Uh, but in building this new version of the render, all of that stuff has been completely stripped out. And yes. now they're essentially, what we're looking at here is, is a first example of real-time path tracing, where essentially they're shooting out rays uh, in a more randomized, like, stochastic pattern, I, I suppose you could say, uh, mm -hmm. which is, you know, normally if you're doing offline rendered path tracing, you could shoot out, like, millions and millions of rays <laughs> over a long period of time, and really, yeah. you know, that's not possible in real time yet. So this is still early. But I guess the clever part of this solution here and what makes this so interesting is the way in which uh, Christoph has sort of taken that data, which by the way, we're looking. what we're looking at here is the raw, I, I guess you could say input data, 
where it's sort of like it's sort of mm-hmm. you're seeing like the little bits representing the rays i suppose and the reason they move is due to that randomized factor there uh but he built sort of a temporal or he's, he's using sort of a temporal filtering as sort of a reconstruction technique yeah. i think alex what yeah get, l- let's get some more details it's, from you because i know i know you've been looking heavily into this yeah um looking heavily into it and also talking directly with christoph like uh, an email right, chain yeah. that we have and based basically there's two things going on there is uh, using kind of neighboring pixels to understand what it should be filtering in and out, uh, and also using past, you know, pixels from previous frames or past rays, I should say, from previous frames and their results to kind of amplify the data that's already there. So what can happen is that in just one single frame, it wouldn't really look good in this kind of unfiltered way. It looks kind of cool, like we're going to talk about later. Um, but it doesn't actually compose like a video game right. image. There's, there's basically Through holes the filtering, in the image as a result. Yeah, there's like holes. So like by gathering ones from previous frames, you can have a more complete looking image. That, uh, so in the end, it ends up looking like Quake 2. But if you turn it off, uh, it doesn't. And there's some side effects from it being temporally filtered and also from filtered spatially the way it is right here. Like, if technically, if you were to stop a frame after a character gets jibbed, uh, you would still see the ghost of their previous image in the yeah, current Yeah, I've frame noticed this as well the, with, the rays. with yeah. um, <laughs> other things, yeah. such as when yeah. there's a large explosion and you see a shadow flicker on yeah. screen rapidly. The shadow's position yeah. changes so rapidly that it essentially can't keep up. Uh, there's too much difference yeah. in the pixel positions between frames, I suppose, and the rays. Yeah. Also, another thing that could happen because it is spatially filtered to make it like kind of even out and look actually like Quake 2, uh, in spite of having a low amount of rays technically, uh, is it could like kind of over blur some of the lighting a tiny bit. It's really not noticeable in a game like Quake 2, which is right. kind of low fidelity and has just boxes everywhere. <laughs> um, but it could technically make them look less sharp or make tiny little shadows slightly disappear because they're just not big enough for the filter to really recognize well. Uh, that's that's normal though, and it's it doesn't look make Quake Two look bad. It does, it looks awesome. Yeah, here, actually, actually, that's one of the things that's so impressive here is that without any of the original lighting data, I mean, it's it's being lit. The skybox acts as sort of a, a source of the light, and the rays sort of take on the color, I suppose, of the skybox. So if you have the mm-hmm, orange mm-hmm. sky. When that ray yeah. comes down and bounces off the surface, uh, it sort of gives everything around it that orange hue, as it should. But there are some limitations right now, which kind of results in areas that appear very dark. Yeah. There's only one bounce after the primary lighting that is done. So, like, the primary lighting is, like, directly coming from the sky or directly coming from a light source and lighting the surface. Then there's only one bounce after that. So... Areas where that would be lit in a more complicated manner, like two or three bounces, will basically be a pure black. And, yes, uh, exactly. So you can see that's, that in a that's lot that's of sort of corners. a problem, which is one of the reasons why I ended up playing a large chunk of it uh, in this unfiltered mode, where basically this command variable disables textures completely and shows sort of the input data. So that's why it's very grainy. It's a little hard on YouTube, unfortunately. So what this shows is... It, it sort of gives a better idea of how the lighting and shadows work in this mode. So, especially with dynamic lights, you'll notice a lot of very soft, very natural looking shadows. And every single thing in the world casts shadows uh, in a very realistic fashion, I found. Yeah, there's even a really cool thing you can see, whereas if you go out on the first level, there's uh, the ships that keep constantly flying overhead, the like fighter bombers. And when they go across the sky, they cast an extremely diffuse shadow that affects the entire arena. And I don't think you could even ever do that with the shadow map, let alone with ambient occlusion. So it, it's a really cool. Yeah, exactly. It, it adds yeah. a new dimension to all of this. And it's, you know, when you're fighting large enemies in the, and you're firing a lot of rockets and you just watch sort of the shadows crawl around the scene realistically, uh, it, you know, the, the shadows are very soft as they should be when the, when they should be I suppose you know but uh, which which is neat and it's not something that we've really seen before usually when there's like muzzle flash shadows in games uh, they are pretty sharp <laughs> my favorite thing you know due to the way shadows yeah. are typically rendered and you know shadow maps obviously have <laughs> pretty severe limitations still 
Um, so getting this, these true, accurate, soft shadows, it's a nice change of pace, and it does give it that more CGI-like yeah. appearance. Uh, I guess another thing mm -hmm. we should talk about then is the way water and other liquids are handled. So they they yeah. do fully reflect uh, the surroundings, but he doesn't seem to have implemented yeah. any sort of transparency in that, or, or at least it doesn't simulate what happens when light goes through, when the ray goes through the surface of the water, and you should be able to see through the water. It's just a straight reflection. It's it's like a perfect mirror, basically, but. It is distorting them based upon the, the surface normal of that water, uh, technically still. Um, so it does look like a water surface that's moving and misconforming and things like that, but it doesn't go underneath. So every single time you're standing on water, it could be an infinite like pool of depth. And They're also using like a lower MIP value on the textures there, I guess, so you, which kind of helps reduce uh, the aliasing effect you'd get on it otherwise. So it actually looks okay yeah it's it's pretty smart thing and uh it, it does look really cool when you shoot like rockets around it i actually yeah. think because you see like the perfect area light of that rocket on the the walls and things around it and also the perfect reflection of it at the same time it it does look like early kind of 90s uh, ray traced cg that you've seen all the time so actually so, yeah uh, that that is kind of a funny point i am thinking about very early cgi tests here with some of this <laughs> stuff yeah where it's like oh yeah i'm starting to see that come to fruition um yeah there's um uh, speaking of, uh, wait, let me say this, right? So speaking of really cool reflections, another thing you can do in the demo technically is there's a, a variable that turns on basically every surface into a perfect mirror and with a oh, very yes, simple gonna, material yes. on it. And you can basically see like 10 recursive reflections of yourself, which is basically just a gun in Quake 2 and the rest of the environment. And I think that's really cool just because we don't actually ever see recursive reflections in video games in the first place, which is basically when you can see a reflection of a reflection in a reflection. Yeah, it creates the Hall of Mirrors effects, essentially. Yeah, yeah that's it. And uh, it also points out another interesting thing that Christoph also talked about in his email uh, with me, where basically the extremely expensive part about ray tracing is not necessarily the fact that you're shooting rays into this triangle structure and bouncing them around. He, he maintains that that's actually kind of overestimated as why, pe why it's so expensive, why people think it's expensive. And this is what this mode kind of shows, as he says. Basically, everything, there's tons of bounces actually going around, uh, but they're simple enough in the shading where it's actually more trivial. Uh, if you turn on the materials that the game has and it has to shade a surface in a more complex manner, then it becomes more expensive. And yeah, this is just Quake 2, so these materials are kind of fake. Like, I don't really think that rusted walls look like that in real life. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like, that's the really cool part. You get to see kind of in real time what is expensive in ray tracing. It's With these RTX cards, it's not really the ray tracing part where it's going through that ray trace structure, but it's like the shading on top of it. From that yeah, and, and by the way, you should mention that to enable this mode, you go into the command console and type RTX on. Yeah, which, <laughs> which is, I, I chuckled at. <laughs> yeah, I do like it too. It's like basically like the extreme reflections mode. <laughs> exactly, exactly. One other thing I guess we noticed was uh, it doesn't handle particles, which is a limitation of the current implementation, unfortunately, which kind of changes the look and feel of the game a little bit. And uh, I guess another element to discuss here then, I mean, you, you did mention, um, you know, there's things to consider. The fact that this is Quake 2, right? And we're not working, or he's not working with uh, like a more ma modern material system, for instance. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's, there's information that's not available to him. It seems like he may be, you know, generating normals somehow by color, but we, we don't actually know 100% how that's doing it. But again, the materials do not end up looking uh, that realistic. And one of the reasons I prefer playing it with, you know, in the unfiltered mode is just, it's, it's kind of a neat aesthetic and it kind of, you know, it really shows off what is possible. And yeah, again, this is really just kind of a tech demo. This is not meant to sell anybody on it. This is just sort of, sort of peeking into the potential for the future. Which I saw somebody actually on, on Twitter say that 
talking about this is almost like a combination of DF Retro and DF Future. <laughs> it is. Uh, we're like right in the middle there. It's uh, so rendering of the future, but at the same time, it's doing it in like one of the oldest games possible, which is really good for it too. Like Quake has tons of lights, technically tons of like cool little light yep. sources in it, like Quake 2. Uh, when talking about how this tech scales to the future, though, that uh, Kristoff has made, we asked him about that very specifically. And I was like, so what would a Doom 3 version of this Path Tracer look like, basically? And the way it works right now, by filtering it, uh, the impression that he gave to us is that things that use more complex shading, more complex material models, and maybe even more complex geometry that had a lot of basically detail within one pixel, and maybe over a, a lot of pixels, uh, that they would be overly smoothed out and maybe overly blurred looking using this type of path tracing that he's developed for Quake 2. So this- It's interesting. Um, I actually think, I mean, Quake or Doom 3's materials are fairly low resolution, uh, yeah. it's texture work. But I do think, um, you know, anything with high frequency detail would probably be lost yeah. using this method. That's the thing. There's like not like there's only a handful of areas in this game that have extremely specular looking surfaces, you know, like uh, the water basically where you can see and that those those run technically also a little worse. <laughs> so yes, they do. I, so I imagine like extremely reflective things with slightly more complex materials would not run as well, maybe in a Doom 3 like environment, which is basically all metal for the most part. So, yeah. Yeah. We should actually, you know, talk about how it runs then as well, because that's kind of a, an interesting thing here. So I'm able to get a 100% locked 60 FPS at 1080p, as mm -hmm. you see here. And also 1440p is fairly smooth as well, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Although I could occasionally dip yeah. the frame rate if there was a lot of explosions happening around reflective surfaces, like the water, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, it was very stable. But if I bumped up to a native 4K, it really <laughs> seemed to destroy performance. It was just, it's just a little bit over the limit, I think, right now on my system with yeah. with that card. It's probably because it's sending out technically a, a greater number of rays at that point. It's not a fixed amount. Yeah, because they're, yeah, they're per pixel size. Also, right? then the shading from those extra rays. It's just probably a combination of things. And I, I obviously had yeah, the exact yeah. same performance as you. Uh, also, slight dips when an explosion occurs, apparently because it's doing another step of important sampling at that point, according to Christoph. And um, the interesting thing to talk about is people have been running this on hardware that doesn't even have the RT core in it. That's right. Some folks were running the game on a Titan V, and it was significantly slower than what we see on the RTX cards. But it was still, you know, you could still play it. I think Kristoff uh, said in his email that it was um, seven times faster on an RTX the 2080 RT core. Yeah, yeah. Versus, you know, uh, the the last generation card. Yeah, th th obviously, there's like there's probably some overhead there between the the RTX 2080 Ti just being better at shading in general, but. The RT core is very helpful in getting ray tracing to be more real time instead of spending all that shading power doing these ray trace bounces uh, through the geometry. Yeah, so you know, that's that's kind of it for now. It's Quake okay. Two. Uh, yeah. There's tons of rays everywhere. It's glorious. <laughs> uh, here's so the last many boss rays. for you. Spoilers. Yeah. Um, but no, really, <laughs> this is a really neat little project, and I'm so happy to see, you know, it's almost, I'm, I'm sure John Carmack is happy to see this kind of stuff happening with his code, or, you know, based on his, his work so many years later, uh, where, you know, they're still modifying it, they're still playing with the game, and that kind of, like, supports his reasons behind releasing it in the first place, putting the source code out there to allow people to do things yeah. like this. Yeah, it, it can only be commended. I, I hope maybe in the, the very near future that we see this also ported to other projects. Uh, I like Quake 2, but I like Quake 1 a lot more. Just throwing that out there. Okay, well, I think uh, that's going to do it for now. Thanks for joining me, Alex. Oh, as always, John, it's a pleasure. The master of ray tracing. <laughs> <laughs> and if you did enjoy this random discussion about the wonderful Quake 2, uh, be sure to like the video, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Go ahead and click that notification button up there so you can learn all about Quake 2. Go watch the DF Retro video I did on Quake 2. It's amazing. And follow us on Twitter. And until next time, keep on fragging.